Hi, and welcome to lecture number seven of Advanced Power Plant Design in the 2014 spring semester at Carnegie Mellon. I'm Nick Seifert, and um, the focus of this lecture is on the balance of plant equipment that we have yet discussed. And um, here we're going to focus on turbines and compressors, even though we will briefly talk about AC to DC electrical equipment, as well as what are called ejectors. Um, sometimes go by the name injectors or ejectors. Um, these are equipment for combining um, streams of different pressure and combining them into the same pressure. So I want to give a little bit of motivation for compressors and turbines because uh, right now they provide the backbone of the electrical generation, the generation side of the electrical grid. And they are used so often in industry because uh, turbines or compressors run directly off of AC electrical electrical systems. I mean, a, t a turbine can output, if you design it correctly, can output three phase AC electricity. Um, and um, another reason why compressors and turbines are so often used is that because this turbine has um, is moving in a magnetic field. It can actually provide something called spinning reserve. And this is where electrical energy is either stored or can be drawn from the spinning turbine. So it allows the, the turbine can um, provide or accept rapid short term um, changes in electrical demand. So um, if you're an owner of a turbine system, you can actually get paid not only for just generating electricity, you can get paid on top of that um, if you can provide the spinning reserve. So uh, another thing is that you can also get paid if you're a gas turbine company for just sitting and doing nothing and just promising to start up rapidly. And that's because gas turbines can start up fairly rapidly compared to other type of, uh, let's say, a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant. Um, you could be a gas turbine company and provide what's sometimes called blackout services, which is you promise um, that you'll start up as soon as if there's some kind of outage, planned or unplanned outage, that you'll start up as as quickly as possible. And so during the times that you're not running, you can actually get income while not running. So these are the um, the kind of the perks of being a turbine, uh, a utility that owns turbines is that not only can you get money for providing electricity, but you can also get uh, money for by providing the spinning reserve and or other ancillary, ancillary services such as blackout services. Uh, and I do want to point out because of this, um, t compressors and turbines have become relatively chafe, uh, cheap, safe, and easy to maintain. And here I'm just showing a schematic of the magnetic, the magnetic field. And what you have is a wire uh, moving around in the magnetic field, which is going to be generating the electricity. And as I said before, in the spinning reserve, this system kind of acts like a capacitor in the fact that it can sto quickly store or give back electricity to the grid, to an AC, to an AC electric grid. Grid. You couldn't do it if the grid were DC, but because it's AC, you can um, provide um, a storage capacity. I did want to point out that um, one interesting thing is that different countries around the world use different frequency of AC. Uh, it can be either be 60 hertz or 50 hertz. So of course this does make it a little complicated when you're purchasing or if you're the manufacturer of turbines because you have to make both a 50 hertz and a 60 hertz um, version of your compressor or turbine um, depending on wh whether or not you're selling it in the US which is a 60 hertz or if you're selling it into a country that's a 50 hertz. So, as I said before, um, one of the advantages of the compressors and turbines is that their output is the same as the grid, which is the grid is typically a three-phase AC. If your power plant produces DC, um, let's say you're a solar photovoltaic, or maybe you're a fuel cell company, and your your output is DC electricity, to get that onto the grid, you need to have a DC to AC converse, converter. So. So I just want to point that out because um, here I'm trying to motivate why 
one of the advantages of compressors and turbines. Um, so, DC, I mean, DC to AC converter, it's not the end of the world, but I do want to point out that typically you're going to lose 3% of your electricity, and there's a capital cost. At the large scale of maybe 100 megawatts, that capital cost for the DC to AC converter might be on the order of $50 per kilowatt, which is not... Um, too large of a price to be like um, your capital cost for the entire let's say this is a f fuel cell power plant you know may be on the order of four thousand or so dollars per kilowatt so the the, the having to do D DC to AC is maybe kind of like a 10 percent effect or cost you know but it's still a 10 percent um, extra cost on there um, some of that's coming from the fact that you um that's the capital cost, but then you also have to look at the fact that there's that 3% electricity you're losing as well. Um, at the small scale, the capital costs of DC to AC conversion can be quite large. So if you're a solar photovoltaic and you're operating at the, you know, let's say, uh, hundreds of watts scale, you, your cost may be dominated by the DC to AC converter. Especially now that um, the price of the solar cells are getting around that one dollar per watt, a thousand dollars per kilowatt, right? The cost of your solar cell may be comparable to the cost of your DC to AC converter. So here I'm going to be showing. Here's a picture of a General Electric 7FA heavy-duty gas turbine. And I'm going to just quickly go through the, some of the main components. I've shown it with the compressor on the left combustor in the middle and then turbine on the right. One way to always tell whether or not you're looking at the comp there's going to be more stages of compressors than there will be turbines. And that's one, one easy way to tell um, that you're looking at the compressor compared to the turbine. So ev even though a lot more power is being generated in the turbine than in the compressor, there are a lot more compressor stages than there are turbine stages. So this particular uh, gas turbine is a uh, about 200 megawatt output when run on uh, meth natural gas. It's got a pressure ratio of 16.2 to 1. So that means the pressure in the combustor is about 16 atmospheres. It's this is a the a, a version that could be used in the U.S., which means it's a 60 hertz. I want to point out is the exhaust after the turbine expander is about 600 degrees Celsius and for this reason this gas these type of gas turbines are often coupled with ranking cycles in which you use that hot gas to boil water and then that water would go through a steam turbine and then um, and that steam turbine is generating additional electricity uh, to give you also size for the flow, we're talking about almost half of a ton of gas is flowing through here per second. Right? I mean, we're talking about very high flow rates. And um, what GE at least quotes from um, last time I checked was that they can go from 0 to 160 megawatts on this turbine in 10 minutes. And this is what I meant before that this turbine, if you owned one of these turbines, you could get paid for just sitting around doing nothing. But promising to to turn on when uh, there is some kind of a blackout, or not just blackout, but maybe just when there's times of high demand. Okay, so the next thing I want to go is we're going to go through the equations, so so we can figure out how we're going to model a compressor and turbine. And what we're going to do here is we're going to make a couple of assumptions. These are the same assumptions that are used in um, Moran and Shapiro when modeling compressors and turbines. Um, it at least, f if you make these assumptions, the problem is um, straight f relatively straightforward. The assumptions may not actually be valid, um, which is, of course, something that we will look at uh, later in this course, is how you uh, improve upon this. But for here, this is the these are the st these are the standard undergraduate uh, ways of modeling uh, compressors and turbines.
So this is what we'll cover first. This is what we'll cover in this lecture. So the assumptions are constant specific heat and no heat transfer to the environment. So with those two assumptions, we can model a compressor and turbine. Um, so what I mean by model is given a certain flow rate and given a pressure and temperature um, on the inlet side and given a certain pressure on the output side, we can calculate the following. We can calculate the temperature on the outlet, the amount of power, and the exergy destruction. Right? And of course the flow the flow rate. The flow rate will be the same on the inlet and outlet. So a way to think about this is using mass conservation we can solve the flow rate exiting is going to be the same as the flow rate enter entering. So that's one thing we know. From the first law of thermodynamics, we can relate the power output to the change in the enthalpy. And this is because, um, so this is that first equation I'm showing here. The amount of electrical work will be equal to the flow rate times the difference in the enthalpy between the inlet and the outlet. So that's the first law, and um, that law then that's valid for steady state, and when there's no heat transfer to the environment, which is what we're assuming here. Okay, so what you can see here is what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to figure out how to solve for the temperature after. And so one thing, so the thing, let me remind you, there's going to be three things that we're going to be solving for here the power, the temperature, and the exergy destruction. And right now we only have two equations. We have the first law and we have the second law. And so there's going to be something else that we're going to need to know. And um, so we're going to be defining something called an isentropic efficiency. So when we use so there'll be an equation that goes along with the, the definition of the isentropic efficiency. So we are now we now have three equations and three unknowns. The three equations are the first law, the second law, and the definition of the isentropic efficiency. The three unknowns are the temperature afterwards, the power, and the internal generation of entropy. So here I, uh, I'm showing you some of the um, some of the equations. That first one. It was the first law. The second is just the definition for the change in entropy between state one and state two for a reversible process. So we're hopefully where you can see where we're going here is the isentropic efficiency is going to be defined as a ratio um, for let's say a turbine will be the ratio it'll be the amount of work you actually get out divided by the amount of work in some isentropic process and here isentropic means that sigma dot irreversible is equal to zero right. the internal generous isentropic 100 percent isentropic means that sigma dot irreversible is equal to zero where sigma dot irreversible is the in internal generation of entropy due to friction, irreversible processes such as friction, um, turbulence, the type of the friction associated with turbulence, heat transfer across temperature gradients, all the all these things that could be happening in here. So because of all the friction and all those, the isentropic efficiency will not be 100 percent. But so what we do is we calculate how much work you could generate if it were isentropic. So in that case the second equation is valid, and so that second equation is valid for I ideal gases, specific constant heat, when there is um, for a reversible process from state um, state one to state two, or shown here, state s to state s naught. And um, so, if s minus s, if the entropy generation is zero you can um, set C, C sub P times log of T over T naught equal to R times log of P over P naught. So then 
P over P naught, where P might be the pressure after, and P naught would be the inlet pressure, would be equal to the temperature after divided by the temperature entering, raised to the power of C sub P over R. So what I want to point out is this was valid for ideal gas with isentropic compression or expansion. And this is how we're going to solve for the, the amount of work in the isentropic case. So as I said before, um, we're going to start with compressors and we're going to do the same thing with turbines. The reason we have to, I have to specify which one is that the, the efficiency is defined differently for compressors than it is for turbines. So for the isentropic efficiency of a compressor, it is the amount of work in the ideal, and here I'm, by ideal I mean the isentropic case, divided by the actual amount of work generated from the compressor. Um, sorry, in the So this is the amount of work that's required to do the compression in the ideal case divided by the amount of work that is actually required. And that no, the, the actual amount is going to be greater than the ideal amount. So the, the, re, the reason um, the isentropic efficiency of a compressor is defined differently than a turbine is that efficiencies are defined to be between 0 and 100%. And um, so if you define the, the efficiency of the compressor in the same way you do the turbine, right, you'd get one less than one and one greater than one. So that for this reason, they're defined slightly different. They're divided. They're they're just kind of uh, the inverses of each other. So as I said, it's the work ideal work divided by the ideal, the actual work. And we know from the first law that the amount of work is equal to the flow rate times the change in the enthalpy. So what we can do here is we can get this equation showing that the efficiency is going to be the enthalpy at the outlet in the ideal case minus the enthalpy of the inlet divided by the enthalpy actually at the outlet divided by the enthalpy at the inlet. And note that uh, the enthalpy ideal inlet is equal to the enthalpy actual inlet, right? That's whatever the in that's defined, right? Because that is the pressure and temperature beforehand. So what we're going to do here, since we had already assumed that C sub P was a constant, we're going to pull that out also. You notice we canceled the n dots, and now we're also going to pull out the C sub P's and cancel those. So what we're left with is um, that the efficiency can be defined. Here we have, um, and now we're going to sub in on the top the equation that relates the change in pressure to the change in temperature. And on the bottom, you see what we form is a temperature at the exit divided by the temperature at the inlet. And um, we're going to now solve for the temperature at the exit as a function of the pressure ratio and the isentropic efficiency. So what we get here is that the final the, the answer for the temperature exiting a compressor. It's going to be equal to temperature at the inlet times the quantity 1 minus the quantity 1 minus the quantity the pressure ratio or that's P exit or divided by P inlet raised to the R over C P, sub P and then divided by the isentropic efficiency of the compressor. So here we now have an equation so this was the first thing we, um, we now can solve for the temperature exiting and if you put that back in to the first law you can solve for the work so that's now two, we have now done we've solved for two of the three variables and all we needed to solve for those were the definition of the efficiency and the first law so let me show you what that this looks like we're going to, in this graph, we're going to change the pressure ratio and we're going, I'm showing you how the temperature after a compressor changes as you change the pressure ratio for three different values of isentropic efficiency. The blue curve is 100% isentropic efficiency. 
the red is 80% and the green is 40%. So what you can see here is, of course, the temperature is increasing kind of logarithmically. And uh, the lower the efficiency, the higher, higher the temperature. And remember, because the change in the temperature is going to be how much work. Here I'm showing you the enthalpy, right? So I'm showing you these arrows. Um, at, so at a pressure ratio of 8, I um, graph three arrows for how much work. So the work is the height of the arrow. And what you, you'll notice here is if you take the height of one of um, the red, if you take the height of the blue arrow and divide it by the height of the red arrow, you'll get 0 0.8. As well, if you take the height of the blue arrow and divide it by the height of the, green, the arrow that goes up to the green line, you'll get a value of 0 0.4. So what I'm trying to do here is give you a visualization of what we mean by the efficiency. Right? It's, it's kind of one way of thinking about it, it's the height of these arrows. And you'll notice that the, the ratio of those heights stays constant as you vary this pressure ratio. Okay, so the next thing, I'll go quickly through it for the turbine case because it's, it's uh, nearly exactly the same. Except for this time the efficiency of the turbine is defined as the amount of work you actually get out of the turbine compared to how much work you would get in the ideal case for a given pressure ratio. So now what you once again what we're doing is we're rearranging to solve for the temperature of the exit. And then now we have this equation that is the temperature at the exit is equal to the temperature at the inlet times the quantity 1 minus the efficiency of the turbine times the quantity 1 minus the pressure ratio raised to the R over C sub P. We now can plug that back in and solve for the amount of work. Here's a case in which we have air at 1000 degrees, starting off at 1000 degrees um, Kelvin and then we take it through a pressure ratio and uh, here I'm showing four different graphs. The blue curve is if, there's, if your turbine were 100% efficient. It's the case where you can get the most amount of work out for a given pressure ratio. The red is 80% efficient and the green is 40% efficient. And then finally I am um, showing a case of 0% efficiency, which uh, I did not show in the compressor case because it would have just been a vertical line. Here, 0% efficiency is a straight line. Um, another term for a 0% efficient turbine is a valve, <laughs> right? What's happening is you're just letting down the pressure and you're not getting any work out. So a valve is a 0%, can be thought of as a 0% efficient turbine. And um, because we made the ideal gas assumption, the temperature is not going to change across a valve as you let down a pressure. It, it's a um, adiabatic pro uh, process. And if we're assuming no heat to the environment, then um, the temperature has to stay the same. Uh, that would be not that would not be the case if you had a non-ideal gas. There, you have like the Joule-Thompson effect that could go on. But here, we're, we're assuming an ideal gas. So I just want to point out that um, we could also graph this as enthalpy. In which case, we can do that same. The height of the arrows. Um, the ratio of the heights of the arrows tells you the efficiency. So the height of the arrow between the purple and uh, green curve divided by the arrow that goes between the purple and the blue curve is going to be equal to 0 0.4, which tells you the efficiency of the turbine. And once again, uh, these curves the height, the ratio of those heights stays constant as you vary the pressure ratio. That that is what we mean by the def that is the definition definition of the efficiency. It's the ratio of those heights. Okay, so the last thing, um, the third variable was the irreversible generation of entropy, and to so to solve for this, we need a third equation, and that third equation can either be the second law of thermodynamics. Or it can be the exergy balance equation. You can do it either way, right? Because remember, the exergy balance was just the first 
minus t naught times the second law, right? So you can you can solve for sigma naught irreversibly either way. Here I'm using um, the the exergy balance equation as the means of getting to sigma dot ir irreversible. And what you'll find is that sigma dot irreversible is equal to the flow rate, right? So more flow for for a given for everything else being held constant, more flow means more irreversible um, generation of entropy. So we have n dot times the quantity c sub p times log of t exit over t inlet plus r times log of p inlet over p exit. But we know we can put t exit over t inlet as a function of the efficiency of the, of the efficiency and the pressure ratio. So when you do when you plug when you plug that into t exit over t inlet, we now get the following equation. And um, I want to point out two extreme cases. If, you, if your efficiency is 100%, so if you put a value of 1 into the, this bottom equation, what you'll find is that the terms cancel. All those pressure terms cancel and the 1's cancel. And um, you get sigma dot irreversible is equal to 0. Right, so this is always a good check. Um, if, if your efficiency is 100%, then extra destruction is zero. Remember, exergy destruction is t naught times sigma dot irreversible. If your efficiency is zero, then the exergy destruction is equal to the flow rate times r t naught times log of p inlet or p outlet. Right? And this this makes sense from the exergy destruction equation, right? Because what we're doing is we're we're losing. Basically, we're just going through a valve, and we lose the pressure exergy which is the r naught times n naught times r t naught oh sorry n dot times r t naught times log of the the pressure ratio now the the efficiency of gas turbines and compressors um, are not just constant so here i've graphed some example ones um, for a given size turbine, the more flow you try to put through it, the lower the efficiency is going to be. So in any real system, there will be something called a compressor curve or a turbine curve, or like a pump may have a pump curve, right? which basically will say as you try to put more flow through, the efficiency is going to drop. The same, same thing happens in a fuel cell, right? The more more current you try to get out, the lower the voltage is going to be, right? Um, and this is true for for any type of uh, real system. As you try to get more flow for a given size unit, you're going to get a lower voltage or a lower efficiency. Um, but there will be normally some kind of optimal power, like in a fuel cell. Um, like the voltage decreases with current density, but there you end up getting a parabola-like shape for the power density. Right? There's going to be some kind of optimal power density that you can get out of a uh, fuel cell. Um, so what are shown here are the efficiencies near those kind of optimal power power densities, and um, those uh, isentropic efficiencies can be on the order of um, like 80 80 percent um, I do want to point out inverter efficiencies like AC to DC DC to AC type conversions are normally around um, like 0 0.95 there is um, pump pump mechanical efficiencies are normally fairly high and I'm, I'm just listening what I'm trying to point out is that these efficiencies are normally some, some, somewhere between 0.7 and, and 100%. And for any problems we do in this class, these values will actually be given to you. Um, or for your class projects, they should actually be looked up. Um, and the best thing would be to do is to actually look up what the pump curves look like or the so that you could actually look at how, as you change the flow rate for, through a given system, that efficiency will will decrease. And for since we're talking about pumps, I just want to point out that here in this class we're going to be using a very 
fairly simple, but actually quite um, um, quite good at actually estimating the amount of work through a pump, it, which is through liquid pumps. So if we have a liquid inco that's incompressible, the amount of isentropic work would be equal to the flow rate times the, the change in the pressure across the pump divided by its density. So the the actual amount of work would be the isentropic work divided by the pump efficiency. And the last topic I want to cover in this lecture is what's called an ejector. It sometimes goes by the term injector. And um, it's actually used a lot either sometimes to pull vacuum or um, another thing that ejectors are used for are mixing um, a high pressure fluid with a low pressure fluid. So the high pressure fluid is sometimes called the motive motive fluid. And then you have like an, and then there's the gas that you're actually trying to pull in. Uh, the in sometimes calls it inlet gas. And sometimes it can be gas or liquid or maybe a, some kind of solid that you're trying to trying to get entrained into a gas flow. Um, the ejector, knowing how ejector work is quite useful because a lot of times you'll have gases of different pressures and you need to combine them. And you don't, and you can't just mix, a, well, if you were to try to just mix, let's say if you put into a tank one stream of a high pressure fluid with one of a low pressure fluid into a tank, well, guess what? The, the pressure at the outlet of the combined streams is going to be slightly less than the pressure of the lowest gas. Because if you just put this into a tank, if you just put these high pressure and a low pressure fluid into a, a tank, um, the outlet has to be less than the lowest pressure that you feed into it. So basically what you're doing is you're just kind of wasting all that high pressure exergy in the high pressure stream. So instead, what you can do is you can run, uh, don't just put these into a, t mix them in a tank. You kind of mix it in a ejector. And what you're doing here is the motive fluid, you change the area in the pipe for the motive fluid. And what you're doing is you're turning it into a, so you're increasing its velocity. And according to Bernoulli's equation, you're decreasing its pressure. And what you're doing is you get it to go to such a high velocity that the pressure now in the converging part of the nozzle is less than the pressure on the inlet gas side. And when you can do that, you can pull a suction compared to the inlet gas pressure. And that will now provide a driving force because you need a driving force delta P to get that inlet gas into the system. The only way you can do that is to pull a pressure in that converging nozzle that is less than the pressure of the inlet gas. So to do that, you need, depending on the pressure of your motor fluid, you may need a really, really high velocity, i.e. Uh, a large change in the area of, of that pipe for the motor fluid. And um, when you can do that, you can now combine the two streams. And then what you do is you then have a diverging throat in which the area gets large again. And as the area gets large again, again, you're turning velocity. You're decreasing the velocity. Um, and the way to think about it is you're changing kinetic energy back into pressure, well, directed kinetic energy into pressure energy. And so this, the goal is to normally to convert one high and one low pressure stream into one mixed mid-pressure fluid stream. And then you would send, um, so uh, let's take an example. You had um, steam at a high pressure and you had steam at a low pressure. And let's say you didn't want to build two turbines. You just wanted to send it to one steam turbine. What you could do is you could mix the high pressure steam with the low pressure steam in an ejector and you get some kind of mid pressure. And then you send that output to your steam turbine. Um, you could send that to then one steam turbine. So the ejector, what it's done is it, it allows you to reduce the number of steam turbines. 
because if not you probably would have needed like two turbines or like one turbine to decrease the um, pressure of the high pressure stream and then and then maybe everything else went through a second turbine now what I want to point out here is that um, um, the advantages of the ejector were that there were no moving parts, it's silence, and low maintenance. Right? Um, uh, one disadvantage is it's sometimes often hard to get started if there's no driving force. And another thing is that uh, there is an isent what we can define an isentropic efficiency for an e ejector, which can be thought of um, as the ratio between the compression energy recovered of the total flow compared to the amount of like energy spent on driving the flow. Right, so how much work is there in the compression er energy of the gases exiting compared to how much was there to start? And using this definition, the efficiency values for uh, of ejectors are typically in the range from 30 to 80 percent. Um, when you actually design it for the actual flow rate, you know, may, typical values may be 40 percent or so. So what it means is ejectors are not normally extremely efficient, but they are low cost, low maintenance, and um, provide you a way of kind of a qu quick and dirty way of combining streams of, of very different pressures. Um, for example, Let's say we had a very low pressure stream of carbon dioxide, right? And let's say we didn't want to send it through a compressor for some reason, but we needed to increase its pressure. You could send the carbon dioxide to an ejector where there is a, um, a stream of high pressure water, um, and depending on how you do it, either high pressure water or eventually you need, the water eventually needs to be water vapor. Uh, so if you had some steam, high pressure st steam, you could run the two through run the steam through an injector and suck in some of the carbon dioxide, and then you have a mid pressure stream of carbon dioxide. And then if you condense out the water vapor you now have a fairly high pressure stream of CO2. So oh, one thing I want to point out here is that when you have exergy in the form of steam and you need to compress carbon dioxide, you have a couple options. You can either run the steam through a steam turbine, generate electricity, and then take that electricity and run a comp uh, CO2 compressor. Your other option is to just take the steam, run it through the ejector, suck in the CO2, and then compress the carbon dioxide. So I just want to point out, when you have exergy, there's a lot of things that you can do with, uh, do with it, right? You don't necessarily have to use turbines um, or compressors. I just want to show out here, the one of the options as a um, way of, let's say, compressing carbon dioxide that does not involve turbines or compressors.